the Lord, everybody. Glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight on this beautiful night, beautiful day. Let's just give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight. Amen, amen. Thankful for each and every person that has made it a point to be here. Most of all, I'm thankful that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Amen. If you have any prayer requests in the house tonight, just let it be made known by the raising of your hand. The Lord knows each and every one of them. But we're going to go before him tonight and ask that he would touch and move in each and every situation. Amen. So if you will, let's pray. Dear God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. God, this is the day that you made, Lord, and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. We choose to magnify you, Lord, in every situation that we faced. God, some people might have went through things harder than the others today, God, but ultimately we're here together, Lord, to bind together, to magnify you, to praise you, and to thank you. God, you're the only one worthy of our praise, and we give you honor for that. We pray, God, ultimately that your will would be done in this place tonight, that every situation, circumstance, God, every pain, whatever it might be, whatever we're facing, Lord, we give it to you tonight, asking, Lord, that you touch and move in those situations. God, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise, Lord, because you're worthy of it. Have your way in this service and bless each and every part of it, God. Touch all of these needs, Lord, for the benefit of your glory, that you'll receive all praise and honor for it because you're the only one that deserves it. We give you praise tonight and we thank you for it, Lord, in the name that is above every name, that name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Changes and what 
Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him a hand, clap of praise and thank him. He's faithful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He is well able. Well able. Amen. You may be seated in the house tonight. I was reading something a little earlier today, and it was an excerpt from Brother Tenney. Some of you know I, I really enjoy to hear Brother Tenney preach, and I really enjoyed reading a lot of his material, but this was a little story that he had wrote down, just a small little excerpt, and it said, a bricklayer was laying bricks one day, and there was a brick that was cracked and had a chip off the corner. He said the bricklayer examined the brick, and he added mud and placed the brick on the wall. He didn't discard the brick. If it was completely broken in half, he just found a corner where it could be used. Every brick in the pile became a part of the wall. This is not a museum for the saints, he said, but this is a hospital for the broken. No matter how broken you are, no matter how broken you may be, with a little mud, you can be part of the wall because we're stronger together. And I thought, wow, that sounds like our motto here at the River Bend. We need each and everybody, Brother Jackie. And no matter how broken we might be, Brother Shannon, no matter what we face, with the Spirit of the Lord, we're able to do all things. And we become a brick in the wall. We become strength for somebody else. Because we're better together, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank Him that He never discards us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But we're better together, amen. Hallelujah. I thank the Lord for His mercy and I thank you for His grace. Ecclesiastes 4.12 And if one prevail against Him, then two shall withstand Him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken, amen. amen. What, a, what a truth. We are truly better together, and I thank God for that. Sister Heidi, if you would, let's give them the ways to give. We have GiveLify and PayPal available at RiverbendPentecostals.com. Cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We also have the text to give, which is 833-883-9311. If you don't mind, let's stand in the house, and we're going to pray this prayer tonight like we mean it. Because I do believe that if we believe, and that's the key, when we believe, we put actions on what we believe in. Brother Shannon, when I turn the key in the car, I believe it's going to start. And then I put it in drive and I drive to work or I drive to church or wherever I'm going. That's faith. Because I'm trusting and believing that that's what's going to happen. It's the same way with a prayer. It's just a token. It's not magic. But it is true. And when I put my faith and I believe and put some action behind it and I do exactly what the Lord wants me to do, that's when the blessings come. That's when the mercy comes. That's when the grace comes because I'm obedient, number one, to his word. Amen. And I want to be obedient to his word. So if you can, let's pray this with authority tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me. Press down, shaking together and running over. I'm a tither and I give my offerings and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in, and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come and give with what the Lord has blessed you with tonight.
Today, that I don't know if, if the rest of you are like me, but there's some days that, Brother Robert, it seems like those and the cares of life have kind of got you shaken to the point where you just don't know which way to go. Then there's other days where it feels like the Lord is just right there beside you. And this has been one of them days, Brother Shannon. That no matter what we go through, it's like I turn around and he's right there. And I thank the Lord for that. I thank the Lord for what I feel in this place. There's like a deep moving of the spirit in this place tonight. And I thank him for that. Because he's here. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, amen. There's freedom. And I can magnify him no matter what I have faced today. No matter what I have been through. No matter if I look before me or I look behind me and I can't find him. He knows the way that I take. But he is in the house tonight. And I am so thankful for that. I can't remember. Me and Brother Tripp has talked about this. And I can't remember who said this. But he said, you are positionally perfect in your past. You are practically perfect in your present. And you are prophetically perfect in your future. Amen. That means no matter what we've been through, no matter how many times we've messed up or failed, God can handle each and every situation, every circumstance. And he's got a plan for each and every one of us. All we've got to do is get on board and believe we are who he tells us we are. Amen. And do the work that he set out before us. And I'm so thankful for the promises of the Lord. And I'm thankful once again for his spirit that is in this place. And at this time, if we can have the River Bend kids to come up. I love these babies. I know some of them don't want to be called babies. They're getting the big boy britches on. But this is a good bunch of kids. It's a good class when we're in the back teaching them. And I enjoy being back there with them. They teach me about as much as I try to teach them. And the funniest thing, I can tell them a story, Brother Tripp, of a Bible story, man, and I'll have it mapped out the way I think I'm doing the best, and they'll remember some story that I tell them about my own life, how I got stuck up in a sleeping bag or how I bumped my knee or how I got lost in the woods or something like that, and they'll always tell me, Brother Blake, you remember that time you got hung up in a sleeping bag, Brother Larry? I'm like, yeah, I remember that time. But I just want to impart something in them to let them know that God loves each and every one of them. And no matter how big or how small they are, they can be used of God. Amen? Amen? If you believe that in the house, let's raise our hands toward these children tonight and pray the blessings of the Lord upon them. Dear Lord, I love you and I thank you, God, that your word says, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, you have a soft spot for these children, God. God, they were created in your image just like we all were, Lord. But, God, you love them and you care for them and they're blessed of you, Lord. God, I pray your blessings upon each and every one of them, and not only upon them, but their homes, God, their mothers and their fathers, their grandmas and their grandpas, God, whoever, God, has control over their life, Lord, I pray blessings upon them. I pray that you ensure and you keep, that you keep them and protect them, that your will would be done in their life, God, and I pray their hearts would be receptive to your word, God. I pray that the 
teachers when they come in the back, Lord, that they would impart wisdom unto them. God, that they would teach them and they would hide your word in their heart that they won't sin against you and they grow up to trust you, Lord, and to believe that you're able to do all things. And we give you praise and glory and we thank you for each and every one of them. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen and amen. All right, boys, head on back. God bless you. Get Riverbend ignited to come on up. And this here blows my mind. I guess I've got a couple of miles in here, but it seems like they grow way faster than we want them to. And I look at them and I'm like, man, alive. I got baby girls, and one of them's about to spread her wings and fly, I think, any day, but I got my other two that's hanging on. It seems like the Lord is going to do a mighty work in these kids if they will allow Him to. And to me, that is the key, is to be available to allow the Lord to work in our life, Brother Richard. There's, there's something special in these kids. I know sometimes they don't see it, they don't recognize it, they don't believe it. We got teachers here that see it in them. But most of all, God sees it in them. Amen. So if you don't mind, let's lift our hands over these young people tonight. I know it's rough being a young person, but God loves them. He cares for them. And I'm going to pray some blessings upon them tonight that God will use them. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, for your manifold blessings. God, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you, God, and we're asking, Lord, that you keep and protect each and every one of these young people, God. God, this world that they have to grow up in, God, the stresses of life, the cares of life, the adversary of their soul, Lord, trying to come against them. God, even from a young age, oh Lord, if he can destroy them now, God, he feels like he's got them. But I pray blessings upon each and every one of them, God. I pray that they realize that they're never but a prayer away, Lord. That you're always with them. You're always by their side. You're always leading them and guiding them and directing them. God, I pray that your voice would be the loudest voice in their life. I pray, oh God, that in the midnight hour when they're all by themselves, when they don't know what to do, God, when they don't know where to go, they will remember that there is a God in heaven that loves them, that there is a God that cares for them, that there is a God that cherishes them, and that there is a God that created them and called them for a higher purpose than the cares of this world, Lord. I pray your blessings upon each and every one of them and their families, and that your will would be done in their life tonight, and we give you all honor and praise and glory. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. How many of y'all glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. One more time as our pastors come, let's just everybody give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank Him for His goodness and thank you for His mercy. Amen. God bless you. passing out the handouts, which I, I hope several of you brought them back, if, even though it's been a month since we did it last, but it's the same one. We're going to finish it. There's an old song going in my mind. I thought about singing it, but I don't have time, and I don't want to put your ears through that, but it says, I feel the touch of hands so kind and gentle. They're leading me in paths that I must try. I'll fall asleep, but I'm going to wake up in God's new heaven, sheltered safe within the arms of God. I feel those arms. I feel that, that anybody ever heard that song before? Probably not like I've done it, but. So let the storms rage high, the dark clouds rise. They don't worry me, for I'm sheltered in the arms of God been a few times over the last couple of weeks that my wife has just said, don't know how people make it who don't know the Lord. Amen. I don't know how people make it who don't have the Lord to turn to. Right. Amen. I feel his presence. Man, Sunday was just a, a beautiful manifestation of the presence of the Lord. Just beautiful. Worship was beautiful. And uh, I'm glad to be here tonight. I hope we have enough papers. Brother Shannon kind of laughed at me. Not really. He just he thought it was cute that I thought everybody would bring back their papers. 
that I believe in you that much. I see some of them. I know some folks did. Um, we're going to try. I, we'll just see what happens. Probably not going to take a whole lot of comments tonight. If you have questions and stuff, write them down. You can tell us at any time. But we got a lot to cover because it, this is important. And uh, it's, it's time for us to move into some other areas. Uh, we're going to teach some practical things and uh, uh, moving forward. But uh, I, uh, we'll, just, we'll see where we get to tonight. And I, I have all intentions of teaching about three hours of material in about 45 minutes. So y'all probably got about as much faith in me to do that as I had in y'all bringing your papers back. Hi, Connor. I'm glad you graduated to the grown folk class. You may want to leave after one class, but I'm glad you're here one time. Connor graduated. We had five graduate this year, and some more connected to us graduated. And, uh, a lot of folks out sick tonight. Thank you, Brother Terrence. I count on you when I can't count on nobody else, man. Everybody <laughs> left me, but man of God. Exactly enough, that's what I'm talking about. That's their, praise God. Yeah. Practical holiness, part six. I'm happy to tell you, um, we had about 15, somewhere between 15 and 20 absentees of regular folks Sunday morning. And we had 164 in-house in the regular service Sunday morning. Isn't that great? That puts, us, that puts us well on our way. We want to remind you, if you're so inclined, we do have a building fund going. And uh, I, think, I think the Lord's letting us know we better get with the program. Amen. And uh, so uh, 164 people. If we had our other folks here, we're 175, 180. And, uh, um, I mean, you're looking at 70% capacity. When you get to 80, you waited too long. That's the rule of thumb. Because if you get to 80% typically and you don't have a plan for moving forward, you actually start going backwards. Uh, we have had that happen before with our parking. We've had people show up for church and couldn't find a place to park, so they went back home. And uh, I, I don't want that to happen, so y'all start carpooling. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. Practical holiness. The Lord's interested in every part of your life. He's not just interested in you on Wednesdays and Sundays, but he's interested in every part of your life. He's interested in how good a sleep you get. He's interested in how you eat. He's interested in how you abstain from eating. He's interested in what you drink. He's interested in what we put in our bodies, what we stop from. That there's not anything in your life the Lord's not interested in. And if you pray about anything and everything, he, he's, he'll answer as if it's the most important thing in the world. Because he's that interested in our lives. And practical holiness in the everyday life was put in place by God as a matter of setting his people apart from the world and holy unto him. Now, I'm going to offer this caveat before I go any further. Uh... I don't expect everybody to get this right out of the gate. But I had somebody on the phone tell me today, I preach it to you, and then somebody tell me today, sinning ain't no fun no more. I can't enjoy it. Ever since I got the Holy Ghost, when I sin, it ain't enjoyable. Well, thank the Lord, it ain't supposed to be no more. And, uh, but uh, if you don't get this, if you don't understand it, if you don't like it, if you just outright rebel against it, God have mercy on you, truthfully. But uh, grow in the Lord. All, every, after every one of these series, just about somebody has come to me and said, well, what about this or what about that? I said, just keep hanging around where the Holy Ghost is. God will lead you where he wants you. He'll fix you like he wants you. He'll mold you and shape you. Can I, cannot I do with you as the potter does with this vessel? Let him mold you and shape you. There won't be a holiness police standing at the door. We put them out of business. They're all retired, drawing their retirement. 
and uh, we, we, nobody's going to, and if you do, if you do, please don't let me find out about it. Okay? Uh, I, I had a, a, somebody come to me Sunday morning. They have a loved one that goes to another church, and the husband got the Holy Ghost, but the wife didn't get the Holy Ghost yet, and so not our church, and not even in this state, okay? So don't, I know y'all start thinking, I wonder who that is. <laughs> Getting on Facebook and saying, anybody know who pastor was talking about tonight? <laughs> Tell us so we know how to pray. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he said, I need to talk to you, pastor. He said, uh, uh, he, he explained the relationship and he said, some well-meaning mothers of the church came to her and said, you're going to have to quit this and stop this and do this. And guess where she's at now? She ain't going to church no more. And this broke the heart of their family. God didn't even roll like that. Matter of fact, he was more drawn to the sinner than he was the one trying to straighten up the sinner. He was. He was. Okay. I'm teaching, I have people contacting me who watch us online talking about how clear this teaching has been. Okay? I'm teaching it the way the Bible says it is. So let's trust the Holy Ghost and the Word to change people and let pastor be pastor and the sheep be the sheep. Amen? That's the way it's going to have to be whether we like it or not. <laughs> They're going to be saying, call Brother Bazzelli to come back or somebody. But I want you to know that the standards that God has put into place are there for your protection, not for your oppression. They are to protect you. The boundaries of separation have been set and are to be observed in our lives because it's safe. Setting and observing the God-given boundaries of holiness and separation results in the creation of a safe place because the same fence that keeps you in also keeps the trash out, the ungodliness out, the tricks of the enemy out. Brother Brian Kinsey said, Holiness is designed to protect us while we grow. Holiness doesn't make you grow, but it protects you while you are growing. Do not, I have a, an article in my iPad. I'm, I may just talk to you a little bit. We'll see. I feel, I feel like preaching my Sunday sermon tonight, so that's why I'm conflicted because I'm, I'm ready to let her rip, baby. But uh, uh, um, God's got a plan for you. And I have a, a paper in my iPad that I copied ooh, seven, eight, nine years ago and it's called Moral Overconfidence. And the gist of the paper is, it's kind of like that scripture, if a man think he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Don't think that you're exempt from the enemy invading your life and all hell breaking loose in it. I don't care who you are. All right? And there are some safeguards that God has put in our life anchors, if you will, some foundational benchmark checkpoints that we can go to and sometimes just grab a hold of them while the storm yes, sir. while the storm rages and we're safe. Because there are several possible pitfalls and dangers awaiting us if we step past the boundaries that God has set. There are inherently a multitude of dangers waiting on those who cater to the lust of the flesh, which is, I want everything I see, the lust, or, or the lust of the flesh, which is craving physical pleasure, I want to feel good, the lust of the eye, which is, I want everything I see, and the pride of life, which says, I'm all that in a box of Cracker Jacks, and you wish you were like me. Pride in our possessions and achievements. We're talking about adornment and ornamentation tonight. In the United States, more money is spent on beauty than is spent on education or social services. It's a fact. Tons of makeup are sold every minute. 
Statistics say 1,484 tubes of lipstick and 2,055 jar jars of skincare products are sold every minute in the United States. I didn't, I didn't send this to Sister Heidi. I wish I had because it would have lost some of its effect. But Leo Tolstoy, who I ask you if you've ever heard of him, if I told you his, his uh, opus, his landmark work, you probably have heard of War and Peace. Anybody heard of that? Tolstoy wrote War and Peace. It's about this thick of a book. But anyway, here's what he said in his book, Childhood, Boyhood, and Youth. He said, I was frequently subject to moments of despair. I imagined that there was no happiness on earth for a man with such a wide nose, such thick lips, and such tiny gray eyes as mine. Now, I read that when we met last and talked about this. So guess what I did this week as I was preparing for this? I Googled him. Dude was good looking. <laughs> Wavy hair, real nice manicured beard. He didn't have none of this stuff that he saw himself as. Honestly, I was expecting to see the hunchback of Notre Dame or something. Really. He, he wasn't. Even as an older man, he was dignified. He had a long beard and, and a little bit of a receding hairline, but he didn't look nothing like that he saw himself. Listen to what he says. Nothing has such a striking impact on a man's development as his appearance, and not so much his actual appearance as a conviction that he is either attractive or unattractive. Simply based upon how he looked, he had a conviction that people would not, that he couldn't be happy because he wasn't attractive. I, I watched a Twilight Zone show. Anybody ever watched that before? I was at my grandma's house, and she's been dead since 1998. But I watched The Twilight Zone, and I'll be quite honest with you, I don't like scary shows. All right, don't like them at all. But I watched The Twilight Zone, and there was this girl on there that she had been having several surgical procedures, and she had her face all wrapped up like a mummy. And the, 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 the pressure of the show was building up that she so hoped that they had been able to fix her. So finally, they unwind her face, and when they get done, she's like Jane Mansfield or something. I mean, she was gorgeous. She had the be most beautiful hair, and I, I was like, what's the deal? Until the camera slides back, and you see that everybody else looks like goblins. And the gist, y'all see what the gist of it is? That one, one guy said, if everybody was look the same, nobody would be pretty. Or nobody would be ugly either for that matter. But the truth is, this is a perspective that has been taught to us. It's true. I'm glad for a couple of amens. During famines, Kalahari Bushmen in Africa, all right, you understand what a Bushman in Africa is, like an Indians from the plains, they still, during famine, they still use animal fat to moisturize their skin. Vanity, look pretty, look attractive. You remember I told you that in 1715, during the French Revolution, riots broke out because the rich people were hoarding up all the flour and the poor people were going hungry because the rich people wanted to have flour on their hair. And it led to a food shortage. And a fight broke out, a war broke out because they were hoarding all the flour up to sprinkle on their hair because it was considered pretty. During 1996, and I know it's a little dated, but during 1996, a reported 696,904 people in the United States underwent voluntary aesthetic surgery. You know what I mean by aesthetic surgery? Something that you could see on the outside they had operated on to make it prettier or enhanced. 
that involve the tearing or burning of their skin, the shucking of their fat, or implanting foreign materials. Before the FDA limited silicone gel implants in 1992, 400 women a day were getting breast enhancement surgery in the United States, 146,000 a year. People do extreme things in the name of beauty. They invest so much of their resources in beauty and risk so much for it that one would think their lives depended on it. And I ask you this question as I asked it a month ago. Beauty according to whom? Who decided? I've used this, if you, if you study uh, sociology any at all, you'll find out that, uh, I mean, women like to tan nowadays. I'm fine with it, whatever. You know, whatever. Go chop cotton if you want to get a good tan. You know, you can do that. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even up into the 60s, a woman wouldn't be caught dead getting tan. It wasn't considered attractive. There was also a time when Marilyn Monroe came out, it became attractive to get a little heavier. Then Twiggy showed up, and it became attractive to be broomstick skinny. That's what everybody wants. The truth is that the fickleness of a person's taste, a person of influence's taste, determines what everybody thinks is attractive. I'm happy we got the Bible. Okay. Everybody all right? I got that book from a, I got those statistics from a book I bought called by a lady named Nancy Etkoff. It is not a religious book at all. It's a social, more of a social book, but the name of it is Survival of the Prettiest. First Timothy chapter two, verse eight, nine, and 10. This is the Bible method. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about how men are supposed to behave for just a minute, though we could unpack it in much, much more detail later on. But it says in verse eight, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. You're supposed to be connected to the Lord, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. Now let me break that verse down for you real fast. Lifting up holy. That word holy means under a divine or sanctioned by divine law. Okay? Lifting up holy hands. Hands represents the instruments used to accomplish our purpose, our plan, our intent. So we are to surrender ourselves to the Lord, men, in our purpose, our plan, or our intent, and our lives are to be sanctioned by divine law. Look at this, without wrath or doubting. I told you we could unpack this a whole lot more later, but I'm not going to. With wrath, I got to look at what I wrote down here because I want you to see wrath grudges. That's what wrath is. Settled anger. It means you have established a contrary opinion and you're not backing down off of it. It's something that's brewing inside of you. Men, are you hearing me? Okay. And doubting. Okay. Doubting. Are you ready for this? This is what that means. Being the source and sustenance. What does that mean? Anybody? Yeah, exactly. Source is the start of it. Sustenance keeps it going. That's what it's saying, men. The source and sustenance of disunity. Doubting. We had a word for that when I was coming up. You know what it is? Henri. Henri, which means you're against everything, against everybody. Men, get that out of your spirit. Okay, it's not cool to be contrary. It's not cool to act like you're smarter than everybody else because you ain't. Praise God. Okay, let's go to verse number nine. Everybody all right with verse eight? You saw that? I'm supposed to present myself and behave as a man under divine edict all the time. There's not a time when the Lord says, let you have an off day. Go and be a jughead. It's not happening. 
In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness. He's not talking to women that make no claim to be godly. But if you claim to be godly, there's a way you're supposed to live in according with that. Amen? With good works. That word professing means a declaration that is fitting. You live your life in accord with being godly. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that's your husband, if your husband won't live right, that he may also without the word be won by the conversation or the, what, the manner of life of the wife. You can win your husband and he never come to Sunday school. You can win your husband and he never hears the word of God. Ain't that what the Bible says right there? That they also may be made without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. <coughs> I don't think we like that all that much. I know it's powerful. And I'm going to tell you what, Brother Josh, this may run off a whole bunch of folks that ain't here and some watching on TV, glad they ain't here, but I'm telling you right now, this is a key to peace in your life. Get it right. Okay. Okay. I ain't scared. I feel the opposition rising up, but I'm not scared because I'm standing upon the word of God. Okay, I got to get to moving. Y'all ain't made one comment, and I'm still not going fast. Here's what. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, that fear is your respect toward God. You respect the Lord too much to behave out that which is inappropriately. Okay, verse 3. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, and of wearing of gold. I'll just say the plating of hair spoke to the custom of they would weave gold and jewels into their hair. That was plating of the hair. That's not just braiding it, you know, with the locks of your hair, but they would, they would wind jewels and gold and stuff all through their hair trying to make a statement. And the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel. You whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God a big deal. Con, I'm sorry this is your first night out here in the big people class, brother. But I need an amen or something every now and again. Because I'm getting nervous. It's a big deal to God to get it right. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. If you're looking for the world to, to define how you behave in your home, you're never going to get right. Amen. You got to get to the Word of God, and we got to start behaving in our home toward our spouses and toward our children and toward our neighbors like God wants us to. Amen. It matters. <clears throat> And unfortunately, unfortunately, that's the place we often act the worst. Men, the first place you're a pastor is at your home. You're the leader of the home. Some of the men got their nerve up to say amen right then. Look here. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women, holy women, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. I want you to ask yourself, what exactly does that trust consist of? Do I trust in God to protect me? Do I trust in God to fight for me? Do I trust in God to honor his word when I keep my place and know my role, he'll do what he said he would do. 
Do you trust him enough to do what the Bible says, even though all of your friends that are out there in the world think you're crazy for it? I told y'all a couple of weeks ago, it's time to cut bait or fish. Okay. Adornment and ornamentation. Adorn means to beautify or decorate with ornaments. The Greek word for adorn is cosmeo, K-O-S-M-E-O, from which we derive our English word cosmetics. It comes from the root word cosmos, which translated world, but it has the meaning of order, arrangement, or decoration. So just as the Lord set the stars and the planets like they're supposed to be up there beautiful, people try to decorate themselves, adorn themselves to be beautiful. How is it that the planets are okay like they were? So just as the attractive and orderly arrangement of the stars adorns the world, so humans can adorn themselves. But the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul make it clear that the, the way women often desire to adorn themselves is in direct opposition to the way God desires for them to adorn themselves. Now our text verses are two very clear passages, and I'm trying to read this because I don't want to mess up because I've studied it and studied it and studied it and studied it, but I've got to stay locked in. Our text verses are two very clear passages in the New Testament that deal with adornment and apparel for Christian women. Boy, I felt something in the spirit right that minute. Mm. I've, I just felt something rise up in the spirit. The word of God is true. Ladies, if you will trust him, he will use you in ways that will blow your mind and will far surpass the acceptance that you will receive when you become like what the world wants you to be. Uh, I, so, I, uh, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Anybody got Yahoo as their homepage? Ain't they into us? Oh, there are a few more, a few more. Yahoo's my homepage. And it's had an article on there every day this week about how miserable Kim Kardashian is. Why did, why did we think that was funny? Because there ain't no way somebody with so much money and so much fame could be miserable. But no, no, think about that just a minute. We laughed at it. I'll tell you what I felt when I read it, validated by the word of God. Because fame ain't going to make you happy. Money ain't going to make you happy. Pretty ain't going to make you happy. You're not going to be happy chasing the world's idea of what's right. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house right now. I feel the power of God moving in here. The Lord is not going to let the ungodly, rebellious, immoral spirit rise up and squash out the power of the Holy Ghost. We're going to preach truth. We're going to declare truth. We're going to live it. We're going to love people. We're, I said we're going to love people. We're going to love them with the love of God. But it, the, ah. Paul said, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? We see very clearly in 1 Peter chapter 3 and 1 Timothy chapter 2 what the standards of the first century apostolics were. Christianity was born into a Roman world of luxury and decadence. And this is the, the culture that apostolics were called to live out their faith. So here, let's talk about some stuff. Jewelry was originally a blessing from God. Abraham was wealthy in silver and gold, Genesis 13. And remember when the Egyptians, I mean, when the children of Israel left Egypt, 
Does anybody remember what the Egyptians did? They went and cleaned out their jewelry boxes and came and brought and gave them all to the children of Israel. It wasn't that they wanted them to look pretty leaving, but in that culture, jewelry was currency. It was God's blessing on Israel for it would give them currency that would pay their way to the promised land. Until this time, jewelry was viewed positively because of its practical function. But a trend, a disturbing trend was developing among God's people. And as they begin to use their ornaments as an expression of pride and even sensuality, this development helps us understand why in the Old Testament God began calling his people to repentance by removing their ornaments. Ladies and gentlemen, when God calls you to repentance, he will also tell you what needs to change. Right. Yes, he will. Repentance doesn't come without change. You cannot just tell God you're sorry and then be all right with it. Right. Repentance involves a change of mind and then a change of life. Yep. The situation came to a head. Does anybody know where it came to a head at? Exodus 32 and 33. Moses was on top of the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. Oh, Lord, I feel Jesus. I really do. I know it's nuts to feel the anointing at this because I am a half scared. We have guests and stuff here, and, and the devil's done telling me, teach something else. You're going to run everybody off. That's, that's hogwash. People are looking for something that's real. This is the Word. This is the Bible. This is the Bible. You won't find yourself valued anywhere anymore than by the Lord God in the Bible. Look here. Moses is up on the mountain and the people said he's been gone too long. They went to Aaron. They said, we uh, don't know what's happened to Moses. We need a God we can see. And so they brought all of those jewels that Egypt had given them that was to pay their way to the promised land. Mm. Do y'all feel that? Boy, the Holy Ghost is moving in this house. The booty of Egypt was now brought and they gave it to Aaron, the high priest, to make them a God they could see. The blessings of God had now become idolatry. Israel had turned into idols the most valuable gift God had given them and Aaron melted down all of that stuff and made a molten calf just like the gods of Egypt. When Moses went back up the mountain to plead with God to forgive their sin, God reassured Moses, I'm going to take them onto the promised land because I said I would, but I'm not going to go with them. The reason I'm not going to go with them is they're in a rebellious place. And if I go with them, they'll all die because my holiness will not be violated. This is in the word, folks. When Israel learned that God was not going to go with them anymore, they deeply repented of their sin and took off all their jewelry, Exodus 33 and 4. In response, God offered to reconsider. He said, I'll go with you. But he said, I want you to prove the depth of your repentance by permanently removing your ornaments, Exodus 33 and 5. And that was also a contingency upon God's further work with them. God's command to the Israelites to remove their ornaments before going into the promised land applies to us as we journey to our promised land. Remember, Canaan, the promised land, is not a type of heaven. It's not. There were giants there. There were walled cities there. There were enemies there, and there are going to be battles. The promised land is symbolic of a deeper spiritual experience with God. I talked to somebody this week. They're here tonight, but I'm not going to point them out. Matter of fact, I ain't going to look at them. But it's time, ladies and gentlemen. 
that it, and a personal evaluation must be made by each and every one of us. I'm not done with regard to how hungry we are for God. How long has it been since you craved being in his presence? How long has it been since you woke up in the morning and all you could think about was getting a hold of God? Nothing in the world mattered. Nothing mattered. The job didn't matter. The family didn't matter. The kids wasn't going to starve if you didn't fix breakfast for them. Tell everybody, get yourself ready for school. Get yourself ready for work. There ain't nothing in the world that matters right now except I got to get in the presence of the Lord. I tell you, I felt under powerful conviction this week, and I, and I got it interjected. I wrote it in my notes right there. When the Lord called them to consecration, he called them to leave more and more of Egypt behind them. How hungry are you for God? How hungry are you for God? We can't just be Wednesday night hungry and Sunday hungry. But Brother Shannon, this is what we ask in recovery. Well, I'm, I'm struggling and, and my mind ain't right and I can't, get, can't win and I can't overcome and I keep messing up and I keep messing up. And we say, what are you doing? Remember that, Brother Kevin? What, what are you doing? Well, I read Harlequin every night before I go to bed. I know I, I'm, I'm sounding kind of funny, but I binge watched NCIS all 37 seasons. I've been on Facebook 97 days in a row. What are you doing? I know this is holiness, but you want to know the ones that get mad about holiness? are the ones that ain't doing nothing for the Lord. When you get cold in the Lord, you become more like the world. And you start craving the... Why do you... Why do you feel like that when, I, when I'm feeling down? Listen to this. This is something that's been told to me. I'm not making this up. When I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling discouraged, I just go get my nails and my toes did and I feel better. You've got the Holy Ghost, for goodness sakes. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Is that all we want is just to feel better for a little bit? I don't want to just feel better. I want to change my world. I want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I want to teach Bible studies and baptize them Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'm not happy staying like we are. We need more. We got to get hungry. We got to get thirsty. And we got to tell the Lord, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Excuse me, for getting, for forgetting it's Wednesday. How hungry are you for God? Uh, I'm about to cause trouble, but that's all right. I don't want to cause Brother Chris or Sister Stephanie or anybody that's watching online any grief. But I'm telling you, I didn't realize what all Aaron was doing until she wasn't here no more. And now Brother Shannon sent me a text message last night that she sent him because she walked out of Walmart. And then people were sitting there bothering everybody that came out. How many of y'all seen them with their little wood stuff set up around their tables, huh? How many of you have seen them? I've seen them a bunch. They're recovery people. And Aaron walked out of Walmart. Oh, come on now. And she pretended like she didn't see them. Anybody else done that before? You're looking at him. I have. She said, the Holy Ghost told me, turn around and go back and see what they're doing. 
I got it. I got the text message. She sent it. It's about this long. She went back, bought something. But more than that, she went back and said, we got Riverbend Recovery at New Madrid. We got Celebrate Recovery going on. It's the greatest thing. She said, I never thought in all my life that I'd be hanging out with a bunch of addicts. But I go there because I love it. And she began to weep and she began to pray and she began to cry. And the power of the Holy Ghost does that to you when you're hungry. I'm not going to make a martyr out of her. But I'm telling you right now, there was something that was burning inside of her that wouldn't stop. I've talked to her grandparents. I've talked to her ex-grandparents-in-law. I've talked to all kinds of people. And they said, that girl's changed. Have you not heard that? Have y'all not heard that? It came from hunger. I got a whole big long list of text messages that I'll never forget. I got them saved in a special place. How hungry are you for God? I feel somebody right now in the Holy Ghost. You've been asking yourself this whole time. I just don't know if that's necessary. You know what? I don't care if it's necessary or not. If it stands between me and the fulfillment of what God has for me in my life, let it go, baby. Turn loose of it and let it go. I can't have no pride active in my life. I can't have no immorality active in my life. I can't have no sensuality active in my life. Because I don't care how sexy you are tomorrow. Five years from now, you are not going to be that pretty. I ain't meaning to be funny, but I'm telling you, there ain't but one thing in this world that's going to last, and that's a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be the same when you're 100 as you are when you're five, when your faith rises up, and your God can use you every day of the week. God can use you on the job. God can use you in your family. The only thing that's going to last is a relationship with God. Mm. Say, I don't think this stuff matters. Let me tell you what. It matters so much your eternity depends on it. Oh, Lord. When God instructed Moses to take up a free will offering so they could build the tabernacle, the top of the list was gold. He didn't force it from them, but the suggestion was conspicuous. Because they brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold to the Lord, Exodus 35 and 22. And then on their own, he didn't call for it. On their own, they said, in Numbers 31 and 50, everything we get from every enemy we defeat, we give it to the Lord. Whatever man hath gotten of jewels of gold, chains, bracelets, rings, earrings, and tablets, Numbers 31 and 50. The Old Testament reveals a growing trend against jewelry because for every time God's people begin to possess it, it led to a spiritual decline through pride, sensuality, or idolatry. The prophets, I was about halfway hoping to run out of time before I got to this so I could get my nerve up. The prophets, the prophets consistently portray Israel as an adulterous woman when she falls out with God. Have y'all read that before? And they always talk about how she's dressed, decked out with jewelry and makeup. As you begin to study, you can't help but see the connection in the mind of God. Jeremiah 4 and 30, Hosea 2 and 13, and Ezekiel 23 and 40. We will unpack them. Jezebel, whom we'll also unpack, maybe we'll try again next Wednesday. I really didn't want to because there's some devils that have reared their head up I got to deal with. Does anybody know the first rule of spiritual warfare? You let the enemy know you're aware of him. First rule. Jezebel's not merely a Bible character. But she's a representative person in Scripture, kind of like Joseph was a representative of Jesus Christ. Jezebel's a representative person because she so completely embodied the spirit of seduction, drawing the people of God away, seducing them, tantalizing them, 
to leave the worship of the true God and turn and worship idols. Her name even carries over into the New Testament, the book of Revelation. Revelation 2 and 20. It expressed God's anger and revulsion at that conduct. We're going to unpack it. Jezebel not only dealt Israel a crippling spiritual blow, but her spirit kept working even over in Revelation, trying to infiltrate the church of Thyatira and cause that church to fall under God's judgment. Not because they were doing what Jezebel said, but because they allowed Jezebel to stay and keep preaching her message. Has anybody ever read that? That's in the book. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. That word sufferest means you allow her to keep preaching her message. To be connected with the spirit of Jezebel is equated by God with the depths of Satan. Revelation 2 and 24. And I don't think you have this one, but Revelation 2 and 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou allow that woman Jezebel. Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Let's finish up. We will finish up next week. Stand with me. I don't know why I'm worried I'm making the schedule. Uh, does anybody feel the unction of the Holy Ghost in this place? The, the shaking, rattling of our cage, so to speak. Does anybody know anybody that does singing lessons? Anybody know anybody? I'm going to start taking some. <laughs> Shut up, Larry. <laughs> that dummy said me too. Listen. He was just begging for compliments. I asked him what he was doing. Uh -huh. There's an old song that says, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. But can you say, it is well? Long haste the day, I love this verse, when my faith shall be sight, when the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Is it well with your soul? How you present yourself declares your wellness in the spirit. I prayed it this week. I said, Lord, I want to be mentally healthy, emotionally healthy, physically healthy, and most of all, spiritually healthy. I prayed it this week. I started riding my bike in the mornings again. I've been reading a book. I've been reading the Bible. I've been watching stuff on YouTube. I got to put holy stuff in me. Because I can't be lost. Brother Terrence, I don't want to go to hell. Not for no amount of money, no amount of prestige, no accolades, no amount of fame, nothing. I don't want to be lost. So is it well with our soul? This matters, folks, because it reflects our spirit and our attitude and our desire. Our desire. And the psalmist said, and I'll quit preaching, 
one thing have I desired of the Lord. And that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Where better than in the presence of the Lord? We want to pray for some requests. Brother Dave and Sister Sharon both are sick tonight. Sister Maria is sick. And then she texts me and Kathy is in Mexico on vacation and came down with a kidney stone, which she has chronic ones. Said, please pray that she can pass it and be all right. Brother Brenton and Brother Logan are both needing prayer. I've got a few unspoken requests. Let's keep remembering Brother Cody, Colt, and Bo, and all their family, uh, all the families. Brother Robert. Ronnie Wallace, let's pray for him. Yes, ma'am. Would there be anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. We'll remember her for sure. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, yeah. Chuck Palmer passed away this morning, and uh, uh, or, yeah, I think it was this morning, early uh, last night. Yeah. Uh, um, he was sick, but it was sudden as well. But uh, remember that family, very, very prominent family here in town. And uh, he's been good to us. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Let's remember Sister Amelia's family as well. Uh, let's pray. Last check I saw, has anybody looked to see how many people watched Aaron's funeral today? Last check I saw was over 3,800 people have watched her funeral on Facebook. Did y'all see that? Anybody see that? Uh, oh, my goodness. What's that? 4,300, my wife said, have watched Aaron's funeral on Facebook. If she was here, she'd be two things, embarrassed and thrilled to death that that many people. Brother Cody told me she came home after Sunday school just here a few weeks ago, and he thought he was in trouble. He said she was just down. And they got on the couch, and she just laid across him and began to just weep. And she said, I'm so scared my family won't be saved. I'm so scared that they're going to be lost. How long has it been since we've wept over somebody's salvation? Huh? Except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. But when it's planted, it will bring forth a harvest. That little gal's message is going to keep being preached. She was not perfect. Nobody's trying to pretend like she was perfect, but she wanted to be. She wanted to be holy. <laughs> like poor little old Bo has caused all kinds of problems. <laughs> because she heard that I want to be holy stuff, and she tells people like when they ain't holy that they better get holy or they're going to go to hell. <laughs> it's a true story. Yeah. So, y'all pray everybody strengthen the Lord. <laughs> but y'all know God's been good to us, don't you? Yes. Let's just thank him. Yes. 
and pray over these requests. God, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your spirit, for truth, the word of God. I pray for every request that we mentioned tonight. I pray that your mercy will be extended. The blood of Jesus will flow. You took stripes on Calvary that we might be healed. I pray against every sickness, every request, every name that was mentioned. I pray the power of the Holy Ghost will minister and witness. I pray for all those that are hearing the gospel, all those that lives being affected. Keep everybody safe. Bring them back to Sunday. We'll have a great time in Jesus' name. Amen. Everything's normal Sunday, 10 o'clock elements, Riverbend Kids and Ignited, 11 o'clock worship.